In 2003, Damien Mander completed his first tour of duty in Iraq. He was to do 11 more such tours, each one lasting between six weeks and three months. Damien was training local policemen in Baghdad before giving it up in 2008. Armed with a thirst for adventure, he made his way to Southern Africa and Zimbabwe, where he started working with an anti-poaching unit. It was an experience that would change his life. We came across an elephant with its face cut away. And uh, I, I called my uh, parents, I've uh, got power of attorney over my real estate in Australia and liquidated everything I, I, I don't, earned, worked for uh, in Iraq, which you know, I had a property portfolio of eight houses and six of those went. So it was the, the first day of the rest of my life. Damien was still learning about the conservation world, but with a vision now firmly in his mind, he used that money to start the International Anti-Poaching Foundation in Victoria Falls. I went from just having a set of boots and a backpack. Uh, we built a small training academy uh, and we train rangers for free. Well, that's how we started off, but the mandate's now grown and we've got some big plans. So from training policemen in Baghdad to helping animals in Africa, how did that happen? Uh, you know, being in a place like Iraq for that long, it gives you a, a, a pretty uh, shitty insight into, into what humanity's like. And you see the innocence of animals and, and wildlife and, and the struggle that the environment's facing. And, you know, you've got to do something. What distinguishes Damien's efforts is that he's an outsider. He comes from a different world. And this is what allows him to look at rhino poaching with fresh eyes. The skills he had honed in Iraq, training and working with people, were being put to good use in a different kind of war. The fight to save Africa's rhinos from extinction. He quickly zoned in on local communities and where they fit in the complex conservation jigsaw puzzle. We're going to be doing a community scout program. That's where we take uh, some of the younger people in the community and we teach them how to work with the animals, the problem animals, how to get rid of the lions, how to get rid of the elephants without having to shoot them. He quickly found his approach and outreach to the local communities in the Victoria Falls area was having good results. Our investigations revealed that while Damien didn't lose one rhino on the reserve his teams patrolled in Zimbabwe, the neighbouring property had over 70 poached. He says it was logical to take his methods to South Africa, today home to most of the world's rhino. And while at least 1,000 rhino will likely be born in the Kruger Park this year, almost 400 have already been poached. So this former sniper and Navy diver from Sydney, Australia, set about establishing a branch of the foundation just outside Hootsprate, a wildlife hub bordering the Kruger Park. Here he joined forces with a former SADF anti-poaching instructor. JC Strauss is a veteran in the industry. I think his commitment uh, to come from aboard into Africa to do something, okay, just to get me again, and I decided no. I'm not going to stand back and let the Australian come to South Africa, okay, and do all the work alone. JC runs one of 20 anti-poaching companies in the Greater Hoodsprate area. A controversial figure in a competitive industry, JC says his bush experience is a good fit for Damien's modern warfare skills. The combination of that is definitely going to be effective because the poachers are using technology. They're using Google, they're using night vision equipment, they're using sophisticated firearms and dust silences. So why can't we use it? Damien's first-hand experience of war-torn Iraq has shaped the way that he tackles rhino poaching. He comes with a systematic approach to training and an understanding of modern wartime technology to aid conservation. As you move up to this area, just come up with me here, guys. I would like to see all the managers get together, get the instructors teaching the same course content, something that's registered, something that's accredited, and it gives a, a career path for rangers. Damien and JC are speaking of professionalising an industry where crucial employees simply aren't paid enough. The minimum wage for a security guard or for a field ranger is around about 2,900 rand per month. Most of them is working 12-hour shifts. They work like 21 days on, 7 days off to protect very valuable assets. Small reward for working amongst the big five and snakes and scorpions, plus the possibility of armed poachers. His field of view is opening up. 
as soon as you can see all the way down the riverbed, okay, you're also checking left and right. When a guy's walking around with an AK-47 in the bush, you can't go walking around with a big stick and hope to beat him. You know, you've got to, you know, we, we, we've got to start pulling some, some tricks out of the box. One of those tricks could be what Damien brought with him from Baghdad, an understanding of how modern wartime technology can be used for conservation. Supported by some of his technical team, he demonstrated the drone in a 17,000 hectare wildlife conservancy outside Hoodspret. Um, we can fly it automatically using the, the laptops and um, manually using a normal RC remote control. Now we're receiving our data through this high gain antenna over here, which um, is basically going to yeah, increase our range uh, quite dramatically. Damien, what range does the drone cover? The one we've got at the moment, uh, and we're coming in at base level, is uh, a 15 kilometre radius, which doesn't sound like much, but for an area like this, it would be suitable. Most poaching operations occur at night, when the earth is cool. The thermal imaging camera in the drone easily sorts warm-blooded creatures from the bush. What we're going to move to after this, uh, the, the drone has a... a a range of 400 miles. It's a bigger drone, it's more expensive, uh, but these are the sort of things that we need to get into conservation. What happens when a poacher is spotted? The drone will actually lock onto the target and hold that target for us and guide ground teams into that, that position and then we can deal with the threat that way. Protecting the rhino is one thing, but Damien felt he had to acquaint himself with the source of the demand, Vietnam. So here we are in, in Saigon's Chinatown. Just looking at one of the stores here, and already we see uh, uh, bear vile ducks here, also seahorses. In Saigon, Damien met former South African Stan Gunn, CEO of Vietnam's largest media company. A man with a soft spot for rhino, he says while trading in rhino horn is illegal in Vietnam, it's both freely available and an accepted status symbol. If you can buy some rhino horn powder for your friends at some party or some nightclub, that shows that you are very rich and therefore your status in society goes up. But it's quite common and I've actually been to at least two or three private homes in Vietnam where I've actually seen rhino horn available and that's been offered to me. How is it offered to you? It's basically passed around and you, you would uh, snort it like you would, uh, I guess, uh, hard drugs like cocaine or something like that. It's been suggested in South Africa that a media disinformation campaign aimed at users in Vietnam could be the answer. Stan says local culture is resistant to such efforts. There have been many campaigns against illicit drugs in Vietnam. The illicit drug trade is increasing. I don't think any campaign that you try and do anywhere in Asia is going to work against rhino horn in particular. Near the Cambodian border, Damien learnt from a renowned local physician that rhino horn has a thousand year history in Vietnam and appears in ancient scriptures of Chinese traditional medicines. You're basically trying to change someone's DNA makeup. It's, it's, that's, it's so ingrained and it's been around for thousands of years. The traditional healer that I stayed with said that it does cure fever. To them it works, they believe it works. The demand for rhino horn has never been higher. Despite years of international bans, no solution has been found. Unfortunately, the, the, the romance of uh, free-ranging rhinos. Um, yeah, I, I just don't have enough faith in the human race to, to sustain that idea. We need to look at logical solutions. In his report on his visit to Vietnam, Damned If You Do and Damned If You Don't, Damien has joined the chorus of voices calling for the trade in rhino horn to be legalised. Wouldn't that just increase the demand? Uh, there's been previous instances uh, with bear bile, uh, with soft-shell tortoise and with uh, deer antler wine. And this is something that used to be uh, hugely prized by, by Vietnamese. Uh, and once the market was flooded, uh, the demand re uh, reduced, and with it the price, and with it supply. Uh, so it's something that could, could uh, which we, we hopefully think could work with rhino horn. With well over 200 organisations on the Save the Rhino bandwagon, Damien Manda and his foundation are not alone. Whether or not legalised trade would work is a moot point, but with conviction and a desire to shake up the industry, we're likely to hear a lot more from the Australian.